right, so there's that. All right, why did I show you that? <laughs> to fight you. Ah! Um, what if he would have said when he's like the red pill or the blue pill, and then it has like the build up of the music? You know, what if he's like red pill or blue pill? What if, he, what if Keanu Reeves said, But I ordered a cheeseburger? Like, I didn't order either one of those. What would have happened? And then, like, the credits just start showing. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that was it. Like, once I ordered the cheeseburger and then the credits. All right, so let's turn this back on. Hey, Shadia. <laughs> All right, why, it, why do you think I showed you that? Why do you think we viewed that? Why do we view the red pill, blue pill matrix thing? Radical skepticism. Because today we're going to start talking about what? Not yet. We're going to talk about epistemology. Right? Epistemology. What is epistemology? Right, that's right. What, what is episteme? Know or knowledge, right? Like how do we know? Right? Something like that. So this this portion of our little section will easily take up probably two or three classes because just like everything else, I mean it's a section. So hopefully this is one of the do I have a big blue mark on my head? Cause like I was scratching my head and had to like think this way, and I thought maybe I had a big blue mark. All right, so anyway, like this is how we this is the study of how we know. So every like philosophy obviously is, is a discipline, right? But then within philosophy, you've got subdisciplines. So you have what? You got metaphysics. You've got epistemology. You've got you know uh, ontology. Well, which is just really another way to say epistemology. You have philosophy of religion. You have all of these sub disciplines under the, the the heading of philosophy, right? So, epistemology is how do we know? Like, how do we know what we know, or how can we know, or can we know whatever anything, right? So, we touched a little bit of the, a, a little bit on this in our first week when we talked about truth, right? See how that was obviously in a way epistemological because the question was what during that first week this first that first week or so because can we know truth right and so even though that really in in a, in a way in a sense falls under what we would consider epistemology here we wanted to go ahead and start that because remember we we wanted to start that because why would you why bother coming to any other class if we go through the entire class and then we're like oh and by the way we can't know anything right? we can't know any truth so we started there because, for obvious reasons, right? For hopefully, as, as what we would see as logical priority, right? But even having said that, we still have to get into epistemology proper. So we'll see how far we can actually get into this, um, it being an introductory course. But obviously, this is kind of one of the. But what we're about to talk about is like the stereotypical stuff that you hear about, like philosophy. Like class is talking about, like when you're watching some goofy movie and it's like, you know, it takes place on a college campus and they walk into the philosophy class, like this is what they're almost always talking about. This is the stuff about, like, how do you know this desk is here? Like, can you prove this desk is here? You know, all that kind of stuff. So, does anybody know anything about epistemology to begin? We gotta start playing audio slave again, right? That's what we need to do. Um, anyway, somebody's gotta know. So you even said something a minute ago. What'd you say? That falls under epistem an epistemology, right? So what is empiricism? Um, it's using evidence to support a claim. Or it's a theory of knowledge, right? Because every 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 particular 
theory of knowledge would say they have some sort of evidence, right? Like, anyway. All right, so let's just jump into it. epistemology. Roughly, this was not a problem until the Enlightenment era. In the Enlightenment era, in the era of, of philosophy, it's around the time of Descartes to, and this is also called the modern, it's, it's called modern philosophy. So don't be confused. Not modern, I don't mean like right now. Like the period of philosophy right now is called contemporary. The modern era of philosophy goes from roughly Descartes, which is 1600s, middle of 1600s, somewhere around there, early 1600s to roughly the 1900s or the very beginning of 1900, which is when Nietzsche ends, Kierkegaard Nietzsche era. So you've got about 300 years or so roughly there called the modern era of philosophy. This was not a problem. This whole epistemological project was not a problem, quote unquote, until the modern era. Why? I, what do you think caused this? Based on anything that you read in your book. Did you read your little reading assignments in your books? Well, <laughs> when you say, do you want me to be honest? Like, I can pretty much turn into a prophet at that point. Like, let me guess, you didn't read it. Uh, um, so let's let's just let's just say it like this. If epistemology, if, if if epistemology is how do we know stuff? Like, how do we know what we know? Like, you've done a lot of this already yourself, just in your life. If you're a halfway thinking person, which I would be willing to wager that most of you are in this classroom, you've probably at least thought some of these types of things. Um, but before we get to that, we're going to talk about the rationalists. And the empiricists. All right, so before this time, before this modern era, before this modern era of philosophy, you had a school of thought that dominated uh, the philosophical world. Does anybody know what school that was? And I don't mean school as in like Georgia Highlands. I mean like as in like abstract school of thought. Does anybody know? Roughly, it was scholasticism, right? A type of school called, called scholasticism. I just misspelled that. Now, again, this is where your author kind of makes me mad because I think that he completely overgeneralizes. Not that we don't all do that at some point, but he, I think he gets just some of this just straight up wrong uh, in the text, and we'll probably have to open that up in a minute. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and open up the text. Turn to page, what, 243, something like that? 240. 240. All right, so, yeah, here we go. So just leave that there, kind of hang out on that. Because he jumps right into empiricism. And he wants to act like that. I'm just going to go just, uh, I'm going to have to go a completely different direction than the book right now, just because I don't think... So, because I want you guys to see that what makes sense from this, I want you to be able to follow it. So, anyway, how we know stuff was not a problem until this area. Why? Because of this, this school system for the most part dominated scholasticism. Now, within scholasticism, you had all kinds of different thinkers. Uh, you had William of Ockham, you had Duns Scotus, you had Thomas Aquinas. You had all of these different guys there, right? And so, the basic theory of knowledge was they didn't really have an epistemology. There was no, there was really Properly speaking, there was no subtopic of philosophy called epistemology up to that point. Does anybody want to take a guess why? First being, it just wasn't a problem. Why, does anybody, why, why might it have not been a problem? Because it was just taken for, as a fact that what? That you could know things, right? That you could know things, right? Well, this whole school of thought comes because people started to raise issues in regards to, well, wait, how do we know that? Like, how do we know that we can know things, right? So roughly you have the beginnings of you can either start with metaphysics. And what is metaphysics? In your pursuit of knowledge or your, in your pursuit of whatever, reality, knowledge or reality on whatever, however you want to dub that, you can start with metaphysics. What is, what is metaphysics? 
like what is real, right? Like metaphysics is the study of like what is real, like being, the study of being as being, like what is real. Or you can start with epistemology. This is where modern philosophy starts. This is why I think a lot of modern philosophy has gone completely off the freaking rails because it starts in epistemology. What is epistemology? What is, what is your beginning point there? But how do we know? Now, you got to remember, I'm gonna, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, like I'm coming at this from a classical realist position, right? Like I follow in the in the tradition of Aristotle, Aquinas, that kind of that school of thought. And why do I, you know, you've heard me get, you've heard me say this a lot. Like why do I follow in that particular school of thought? Because I like it. Hopefully not. Hopefully that's the last reason I'm fo I follow in that particular school, right? Uh, because I think it's true, right? Now, and I'm saying interest full disclosure because I want you to know that I'm coming at it from that angle. Uh, angle. I'm coming at it from that angle. Um, but I want, but I, but I've adopted that position because I feel like that it's true, right? So, so hopefully, what we're going to see is I'm hoping that you'll see that that makes the most sense uh, as well. Uh, one of the famous lines from one of the most famous, or one of the most famous uh, classical realists out of that tradition. Basically, likes to say it this way. He likes to say that the only people that treat you as if you don't have any knowledge at all when you show up are used car salesmen and modern philosophers. All right. So he would say classical philosophers, when you walk into the, the classroom or whatever, like say me, for instance, like I assume that when you come in here that you know bring something to the table, right? And as remember, as Aristotle said. We can play the game of skepticism, which we will, but I'm assuming that you know some things already. So when we say that you start, you can start with metaphysics, it means that you start with, all right, I know that, you know, some of these truths about reality. Now the question is, how do I know, how do I know that? How do I know, if I know that there's a desk right here, how do I know that? Very right, or not, maybe not even certain, because certain certainty is a very, very, very tricky word in philosophy, right? Um, and we may get to that. Now, epistemology says, I don't even know if that's there until I can establish some reliable way to get there first, right? Now, the problem, as I see it, and as, as almost everybody sees it in philosophy, is that if you start with epistemology like modern philosophy does, is that you're going to end up off the rails. You're completely going to go off the rails. Um, and hopefully we'll see why that happens in a second. So, this whole modern theme, this whole modern problem is launched with something just like we watched right here. So, the Matrix is not new in any shape, form, or fashion, except that it just repackages an old philosophical problem. Does anybody know what the original philosophical problem was? Well, when I say original, I mean the, the most famous in the sense of uh, culture and, and, and the philosophical world. Who started this problem? It wasn't Keanu Reeves and, you know, Lawrence Fishburne here. Does anybody know? It's heard of this guy. Who's heard of this guy? That says Rene. Well, this doesn't say Rene, it will. Rene Descartes, right? French guy, right? Ken to Madison back here, right? Now, Descartes comes along, and there's a lot of variation in the school up here, scholasticism. There's a lot of different opinions on stuff, right? So he comes along, and he sees a non-consensus. He sees a lack of consensus, right? He says, well, this guy says this, this guy says this, this guy says this. Well, I'm just going to throw out the whole thing, because no, there's no consensus, so I'm going to throw it all out, right? That's what he does. And so he says, I want to create a new systematic philosophy that begins with complete certainty, what's called foundationalism. He wants to begin in certainty because he wants to come to something that everybody has to come to consensus on, like math. He wants it to be literally as certain as mathematical problems. Like, for instance, so when someone says 4 plus 4 is 8, no one disagrees with that, right? He wants to come to a philosophical system that works that way, that there is no disagreement. There's no disagreement at all. And so he goes off to this little cabin in the woods or whatever, literally, and, and he sits there by himself, 
And he's like, what, what can I not doubt? Like, how can I know that what I know, how, how can I know these things or not what I know, but how can I even know? Is there any way to be certain that I can know? And so who's heard of this right here? Somehow, even if you haven't graduated from high school, you've somehow heard this. Everybody's heard the Kajito, Ergo, something, right? What does that mean? Now, when I translate it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I heard that, I heard that. I think, therefore, I am, right? Who's heard of that? I think, therefore, I am. It's a little bumper sticker. You see it all the time. So, good night. Can you remember that? We're in trouble. Anyway, I think, therefore, I am. I think, therefore, I am. And we'll get to what that means roughly in a second. So Descartes says, this is the question you guys have all probably pondered at some point. How do I know that I'm not dreaming right now? Right now, he's going to go through this a different way. Now, even that has been formulated even earlier uh, by an ancient Chinese guy. The whole butterfly dream. You know, I, I was dreaming I was a butterfly, but then how do I know I wasn't a butterfly dreaming that I was a man or whatever? But this is roughly the same thing. So Descartes says, is it logically possible right now that I'm dreaming? Is that possible? Logically speaking, is there any inherent contradiction in saying that? Not a, there's apparently no contradiction in saying that it's possible that I'm, a, I'm dreaming right now, right? So he says, now what if, and again, for sake of argument, what if there was a malevolent demon or whatever, you know, we might say something like a mad scientist, that right now, as you're brain, you're laying in a bed somewhere, you're laying in a hospital room somewhere, and you're you're completely just wired up uh, by this mad scientist to have these, uh, yeah, I mean, just just this life experience that you're having. But really, to put it back into the malevolent demon's hands, as Descartes did, that you're just being tricked. That he's constantly tricking you into believing what you think that you know about reality. That you're constantly just in this state. So, again, the mad scientist, you can think of it that way, that you're right now, how do you know right now that you're not just in a bed somewhere having this dream of that you're in a philosophy classroom or whatever the case may be? How do you know that? Or as the Matrix that we were just watching, how do you know that you're not just in the Matrix, that you're just wired up somewhere and you, all of this experience of reality is not reality? You're just... You know, if you could somehow transcend and see what the truth was, that you're just laying somewhere in a bed wired up to all these wires or whatever, or a malevolent demon or whatever is tricking you into believing what you think that you know about reality and all that. How do you know that? What might you say? How could you, how could you prove right now that you're not in some sort of dream state? <laughs> what might you say? Like, is there anybody in this room right now that's worried that you're dreaming? Why not? How do you know that? Well, because even if your words are relevant to the fact that you're here now. But how do you know? How do you know that you're here now? How do you know you're not just still in your bed asleep? What's that, Lacey? I don't care. Like... Well, I mean, I would. Well, is there any reason why you should care? I won't say. I'll wait. There, there would, I imagine that there's not something like that going on, trying to think of everything controlling the thing, which prevents us from questioning it. I don't know. Well, unless again, the malevolent, malevolent demon, the malevolent demon. Easy for me to say. It's just wiring you to act like you don't care about it, right? Maybe he's just tricking you into that. Go ahead. Or you don't say you're just making a like. <laughs> I was just making a doo doo face. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing is that that line bothers you a lot more. There's a lot more assumptions to be made about the universe in that line of thought that's simply. Can't 
how do you know that though? But how do you know that you're not just being fed these thoughts? Because you have to be able to think to be fed thoughts. But how do you know that you're not being fed those thoughts? Or even just back to before, before we get to that, just back to our question, how do you know that you're not dreaming right now? You can't know. So you're willing to say that you might be in a bed right now just to sleep somewhere. But, like I said, the question itself is irrelevant to the here and now. It's, it's worrying about things that are untangible. Things that you can't really do anything about. You have to focus on what your mind is able to interpret. You can say that you don't know if there's a death there, but in your mind you can sense it. You can see it. So you're fine with it being a dream? So you know, this is a dream, too. Dreams aren't always just, you know, one thing leads to this and you can jump around. But in a dream, doesn't it make sense? Like, you think it's real in the dream, right? Like, when you're dreaming, you think that things are real, that you're that they, that they make sense, right? Like, my wife and I constantly joke about, like, I'll tell my wife about some dream I had, and, it, you know, it can make no sense at all. You know, I'll be like, I'm driving in a car, and all of a sudden I'll fly or whatever. And, and, but in the dream, it makes perfect sense, right? But when you wake up, you see how ridiculous that is, right? But in the dream... It makes sense. It just for some reason doesn't seem weird. If you, you're trying to dream and you don't think of of your day before and think of how that didn't make sense. Right, but when you're dreaming, like right now, if you're dreaming, all of this makes sense. All of it makes perfect sense in your dream. If you're but dreaming right now. So then if we were to go to sleep and dream, you wouldn't think about today and think how it didn't make sense. But how do you know you're not dreaming right now? What I'm saying if if it was like if we thought in that process like Right, but you could be saying all of this in your dream, right? You could be saying all of this stuff. Like last year or last semester, I had a guy that tried to pull out, you know, this, he was like, no, scientists now have proven that they can do perform some sort of experiment, you know, um, to show that, you know, that he's not, you're not asleep or whatever. And I was like, but you could just dream that. That's why, like, one, by, again, like, we, like, scientists really should take philosophy courses, right? Because literally, like, that's probably the worst argument that you could possibly have. What well, perform an experiment? What? Like, could you not just perform experiments? What? In your dream? <laughs> like, you can just dream that you're performing experiments. You can't get out of that, right? Now, Descartes was like, this really bothers him, right? Because he realizes that any answer you say or any answer you could get, you give could what? You could just be dreaming what? <laughs> that. You could just be giving that answer in your dream, right? And then so he says, I've got to get back to some point that I can't possibly doubt. You see what I'm saying? Because you can doubt that, right? You can doubt that you're here right now. It's logically possible that you're in the bed somewhere. Right, and you're just dreaming. You're in a philosophy class, or whatever, or wherever, whatever it is you're doing, and it makes perfect sense in your dream, right? Now, the, the car's like, all right, this won't do. There has to be some sort of, and this is what he calls clear and distinct ideas. He wants to get back to some axiomatic, fundamental point where knowledge can start, where knowledge can begin, that no one can question it, right? Because we can question one if we're even here right now. Why well, we can just easily go to an example of it of the dream or an example of a malevolent demon or an example of, you know, you know, you're in a <laughs> hospital bed just wired up to electrodes, you know, or the matrix or whatever. So he's like, we got it. There's got to be something that can't be doubted. There has to be something. So what is Descartes solution to what, what does he feel like is the solution to this can't possibly be doubted? Logically speaking, or his beginning point, his number one, Axiom, where he tries to begin his entire philosophy, he tries to build it off what? Right. How does he try to say that you can be certain of your own existence? Right. How? Because by the way, this doesn't mean all the crap that a lot of people think it means. I think, therefore, I am. It doesn't mean. It doesn't mean like oh, because you're a thinking person, right now you're flourishing. It doesn't mean any of that junk. This is a philosophical axiom to prove existence that you exist in the strongest philosophical sense possible. How? Because Descartes says this. Look, he says, "All right, I'm doubting. I can doubt everything." So one of the things he says he can doubt is his senses, right? Like you can say, "Well, I can't doubt that I have an arm," but Descartes would say, "What? 
Yeah, you can. How can you doubt that? He would say. Have your senses ever fooled you before? Like, have you ever put a stick in water and it looks bent, right? Does that make sense? No pun intended. And then you pull it out and straight, right? But did your senses tell you that the stick was bent, right? But it really wasn't bent, right? Or have you ever seen like a mirage off in the distance? Like if you're waiting in a red light and then and way off in the distance on a hot summer day, you see the heat coming off the road and it looks like water, right? Have you ever seen that? But was there really water there? Or have you ever been in a parking lot and you saw someone and you thought it was so-and-so and it really wasn't so-and-so? Because you know, your senses fooled you, right? Have your sen- The point being, have your senses ever fooled you? Yeah, right, they have. So he says, how do you know that right now your senses aren't fooling you? So can you logically doubt that you have an arm? Can you logically doubt that you have a leg or whatever? You can logically speaking doubt those things, right? That's Descartes' point. He says, so we can't necessarily trust our senses. Why? Because our senses, what? Can deceive us, right? So we can't build our knowledge on based on your senses because your senses can deceive you, right? I mean, who admits that your senses can that you can be fooled or whatever by your senses or that you think that you've been fooled by your senses, right? I mean, that seems like it's true, right? I don't think that's too controversial. And he says, but also, even just dreaming, right? Like one time I dream, like, dude, this is going to be funny. I dream I have long hair again all the time. Constantly dream I have long hair all the time. And obviously, well, I'm not a psychologist, but that probably is some sort of psychological deal because I want to have long hair again. Now my sidetrack, you know, little rabbit trail right here my wife loves the fact that i have to cut all my hair off now because she hates like she hates long hair so she loves i hate i hate this like whatever you call this do this hair do but she loves it because it keeps my hair like completely off like it would be down to here otherwise right so she likes that anyway i'm constantly dreaming that i have long hair all the time i dream that long curly hair and in, in the dream it's real right but what but that's not real, is it? Like, I'm dreaming now. I wake up, and I'm like, ah. Even just last night, I dreamed it again. I was walking around, had my hat on, long hair coming out the back, and I was like, yeah, it's my hair. And then now it's not here. Right? So, so the point is, Descartes says, you could dream. If you can dream that you can have hair, you can dream that you have what? An arm or a body of any sort. He said, but you don't even know that you have that. Why? Because you're depending on your senses for that, Right? But your senses can what? Fool you. They have a body or an arm or a leg. Is that, is that what he's saying? No, he's not saying that you don't. He's just saying that what? You just can't know, right? You just, you're just not justified in knowing. So he's like, I've got to get to something. Because obviously he's going into despair, right? Like, how, do I, how can I know anything? Like, everything can be doubted. Like, I can even sit here and doubt, logically speaking, what? Did I have a body? So, like, how can I know anything? Right? Because, again, remember, the point is not that you can't just live this way. Sure, you can continue just to be like, ah, it doesn't matter, I'll just live. But that misses the point of what he's saying. He's saying, like, I want to know. Like, I want to be able to know things. Right? Personally, I'm that way. Like, I want to. I don't want to just say, "Well, you know, this is the best I can do. I'll just live." I, I want to know. Kind of like the Matrix thing. Like, all right, you can take this pill or this pill, and know the truth, or you can just live in La La Land and not and just act like you don't care, right? I want to know if possible. And so Descartes, like, I want to know. You know what? And what can I know? So this is Descartes' axiom. This is what the Cogito Ergo Sum means. I think, therefore, I am. He says. If I can doubt everything, if everything can be doubted, logically speaking, there has to be some way. I want to get to a point that I can't possibly doubt. I want there to be something that they can't possibly be doubted. And so this is his train of thought. This is essentially how the argument runs. If I'm doubting, I can't doubt that I'm doubting. Why? I can't, right, I can't, that's right, that's, no, that's right, I can't doubt that I'm doubting, why, because if I doubt that I'm doubting, then what am I doing, no, I'm doubting, if I doubt that I'm doubting, then what am I doing, I'm doubting, so it can't, so it can't be denied that I'm doubting, does that make sense, hang with me, it can't be denied that I'm doubting, why, 
Right. Because if, if I doubt, if I doubt that, then I'm doubting, right? But if I'm doubting, then what am I doing? If I'm doubting, then what am I doing? I can't even, I can't lock, I can't even possibly doubt that I'm doubting. I can't do it. So if I'm doing that, if I'm doubting, then what am I doing in the process? What's that? Right. So that's a, that's a starting point. You can't doubt that you're doubting because if you doubt that you're doubting, then that just means you're doubting. All right. So what am I, what, what is, what does Descartes say he's doing if he's doubting? He's thinking. That's right. If I'm doubting, then I have to be what? Thinking. So Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. Why? How does he make how does he get to this? If I'm thinking, then what? What do non-existence do? Non-existence are not, and they do not, right? What does a non-existent thing do? <laughs> Nothing. It doesn't do, it's no thing, right? It it does not, and it is not, and it are not, right? To be grammatically incorrect, right? But philosophically correct. There are it's uh, uh, no thing is are not. There is no thing. It is not, it's not are not, it can't not, it thinks not, it doesn't do anything, right? Because why? It doesn't exist, right? So if I'm thinking, then I have to what? I have to what? If I'm thinking, what does that mean? I have to exist. Because in order to question my existence, what do I do? What do I have to do? In or if I'm questioning my existence, then I catch myself existing just in order to what? Question my existence, right? So if I'm sitting here, do I even exist? Do I even exist? Do I have what? What's questioning the existence? There has to be something. What right? you catch yourself existing. And the question of what? Questioning your very existence. You catch yourself existing, right? So he says, I think, therefore, I am. Meaning I am means what? I exist. I can't, I, I catch, in order to question my existence, I have to catch myself existing in order to question my existence, right? Go ahead. It's a little, like, I don't know, interesting. Um, Crap. Obviously, you know, <laughs> I have a lot of dreams where. Oh, um, here we go. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. So go ahead. Where I question everything that's going around me in the dream. I'm like, this is really weird. Like, oh yeah, thing. a lot of times in my dreams, I'll be like, I'm dreaming right now. I know I'm dreaming. Yeah, but then we did. But sometimes I don't. Dream. Well, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a dream. Right. Like most of my my dreams are lucid dreams. So. All the time, man, especially I know this is kind of like pessimistic, but if something's going like good in my dream, I, I'm always like, I'm obviously dreaming right now. Like, <laughs> I'll wake up and this won't be real. And then, you know, I'll wake up, you know, and it's right. I'm like, uh, or I have a, a reoccurring dream that I'm back in like college math again. I dream that a lot. Isn't that crazy? Um, so there must be some sort of psychology. I mean, I don't like math, so there's probably has something to do with it there, but. Anyway, so in order to question your existence, what do you have to do? You have to exist, right? Because in order to question your existence, there has to be something there to question your this existence, right? But so if you're questioning it, you find yourself existing in that moment, right? So that's what the whole "I think, therefore I am" means. Is this is this is Descartes' starting point? This is his number one rock bottom. This is where you start philosophically. I think, therefore I am, right? And so Descartes thinks that you are essentially what? What does he think you are essentially? And he is essentially. That people are essentially. Thinking things. That you're not essentially a body, right? You're about to see how prevalent this has become in our society. That you're not essentially a body. You're essentially what? A mind or a soul. A mind or a soul. And you have a what? Body, yeah. Right. And this is called mind-body what? 
mind-body dualism. Right? Because you're a dualistic thing. You have a, you're a soul or a mind, and you have a what? Body, right? Now, the crazy thing is most people associate this with what? This, this type of view with what? What's that? Religion. Right, re religious belief, right? Or some, or some sort of spiritual belief. Now, the nuts crazy thing is would you, is that true? Is that the view of most religious type people or spiritual type people, however you want to phrase that? Now, what's going to rock your mind is this has never been the position of, say, something like class Christian faith. It's never, that's never been its position. But how popular is that now within what? Right, and especially even what? Right, the Christian faith that we know now, right? That a mind body dualism, but that's not been the classical position. Now, this this is on hard times. Why this view is on is 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 it is, is, is finds itself currently within a very hard time. Why? Well, that's the that's the argument, right? Is that you can't prove that there's anything that's non what? Non right, non physical, right? Because everything now. There's a view called what? Physicalism or what? Materialism. Right? The only thing that exists is material. Right? Now, we'll get to that way later. Let's don't get sidetracked. But anyway, I just wanted to go ahead and point out while we were talking about this, that it's on hard times as well. Right? So, Descartes thinks you're a thinking thing. So, he starts his whole process here with, I think, therefore I am. So, meaning that how do I know I can get to... Because can anybody see why this is his foundational point? Why this is his axiomatic point? Why is this his? Why is this his? his where he's going to build everything from? Because it can't what? Yeah. It can't be doubted, right? It, well, it can be, but what happens? You right, right. Something like almost in a way, so, something like what we talked about the first couple weeks. First principles, right? Something similar to that. He thinks this is basically acts in in such a way. Right. So he wants to start his entire philosophy here. Now, having said that, this is going to give, and we're being a little over simplistic here, but this is essentially going to start one camp in philosophy called the rationalists. And this really goes even back to ancient Greece, but we're going to just, for, our, for simplicity's sake, we're going to say, we're going to show them here. The rationalists... Why do you think that would be called the rationalist camp? And all this is under epistemology. Why would that be the rationalist camp? Because you think that you find truth primarily how? That you find knowledge about rea reality prim primarily how? Which would mean what? The mind, right? The mind. Now, again, we're being, we're being, we're just ramrodding through all this stuff. Now you've got this other school of thought, empiricism. How do you think they're going to say, for the most part, you find the truth about reality? What's that? Well, remember, we can't use we're, use the word evidence very loosely there because they're going to say that they're not using evidence, right? They're say they're being rational too. So what do you mean when you say evidence? If you're going to say, if you're going to use that word, what do you, what do you mean? Right. And so what is empirical? No. What am I naming off right here? <laughs> yeah. What do they represent? That's right. Your senses, your five senses are how you get knowledge about the world, right? So empiricism, empirical, like empirically verifiable, I think this is how you get knowledge of the world. Your senses are what give you knowledge of the world. Now, this is going to be picked up by a guy named John Locke around the same time of that Descartes doing his project. You've got John Locke and you've got others. 
you've got all kinds of guys that are in the rationalist camp, and you've got a lot of guys that are in the empiricist camp. But the ones that we're going to talk about primarily are going to be obviously Descartes, just because he's kind of the figurehead of that camp in some ways. Some that, and that's arguable. Some might say somebody like Leibniz or some of these other geniuses that are in that camp. But and then for the most part, on this side, we're going to stay with a guy named David Hume. Now, before we get to these guys, we've got to deal with and talk about something first that really results from both of their camps. Because both of them, remember, what do they want to do? What are both of these camps trying to do? What are they trying to do? What is epistemology? Not prove how we know things. Right. Right. Now, old school classical realism would say, would do what? That would try to prove what? How we know what we know, right? Because remember, we're not assuming, we're not the used car salesman, right? That you don't know anything. We're assuming, well, no, you know things. Now, is there a good reason to think we know it, right? How can, how can we know that we know that? How do we, well, how do we know that? These guys want to say, can we know it, right? Now, that's why both of these really lead into what? So it's kind of a giveaway. As a moderate realist, myself, we're going to say that rationalism, pure rationalism, and pure empiricism lead what to what? Namely, because Descartes' project is going to fail. We're going to talk about why his project is going to utterly fail. It's going to collapse down into what? Skepticism, right? David Hume, figurehead of the empir empiricists over here, we're going to use him, is going to what? Is going to what? <coughs> Collapse down into what? Skepticism. Hume, Descartes, does he want this? Is that, is that what Descartes wants? No. Descartes does not want skepticism. Remember, his entire project was to, was to what? What was the point of his entire project? Solid to kick this into gonads, right? To defeat this. Because remember scholasticism up here, he thought there's a lack of consensus. You couldn't really know anything. He hated that. So what did he want to do? He wanted to start a philosophy. He wanted to build a methodology, what? That we could what? Know stuff, right? Bad news for Descartes. It opens up a complete Pandora's box, right? Because it, we're, and we're going to see it just his, his project fails. You're not going to meet very many, if any, Cartesians now because his project fails. It results in what? That's right here, right? Back to square when we don't know anything, right? David Hume is almost proud. He almost, he seems to be very proud that he can show what? That he is a that he embraces empiricism, but what? But but at the same time, it does what? He's almost glad to show this, right? He's going to take pure empiricism to its logical consequence, which is what you don't know. Shoot, right? Descartes hates it, but his rationalism takes you into what? Skepticism. So now we're back to. Now, within the philosophical community of nowadays, the most people embrace skepticism, like professional philosophers. No, they don't. Most of them don't, right? 
But the problem is, most of them have a very hard time, what? Answering it. Why? And then I'm going to tell you what I think. Why? What were you saying, Mike? Well, because their arguments are, are very what? They're almost ingenious, right? Unless, and then we'll get to this, unless you go back to what? What was up here? Right, or Aristotelian, right, Aristotelian Thomism, right? Which was thrown out, the classical realist position, right? It was tossed out, right? But what if, but what if what was thrown out had answers to what? To this stuff. What if that was thrown out too early? Because remember, why did Descartes throw it out? Because there was lack of consensus. Now, let's look at something logically. There's lack of consensus. This guy says this, this guy says this, this guy says this, this guy says this, let's throw it out. Logically, what follows from that? What follows logically from that? Nothing. My wife teaches third grade math, right? Let's say she puts a pay a problem on the board. Blah 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 equals blah blah blah. This is Aramaic for blah blah blah. So what if all of the kids in her class get the problem wrong? There's no there's a complete lack of consensus as to the answer. What does that mean? What's that? Which means what? Or what do, what doesn't logically follow? <laughs> what somebody saying? She shouldn't be teaching. That's funny. Who said that? That was funny. I'll have to use that next next time. What's that? Uh, no. What what doesn't logically follow is if all the kids in the room get the answer wrong, it doesn't follow that what that there isn't a right answer. So because Descartes, if there's not a consensus, so I'm going to throw it all out and start over. That was completely, from the classical realist position, what? Immature. And I don't mean that in the pejorative way. I mean, as in, like, not thought, like, there wasn't, there wasn't a, wait a minute. Go back and just throw out what's not right. Try to pull out what's right. Does that make sense? Because why is this system still alive? Because it's strong. No, that would be, just be pragmatism. Because it's a strong philosophical what? It's a strong philosophical position. But we'll get to that. So why does Descartes, why does Descartes, why does his philosophy fail? He wants to build, he wants to have clear and distinct ideas, right? Those things that can't possibly be doubted, right? That can't possibly be doubted. Where does he start? You guys know, where does he start? I think, therefore I am. So what he wants to do is he wants to he wants to build from that foundation some sort of argument that we can know reality that what you think you know right now really is the is the truth. So how does he how does he feel like how is he going to do that? How is he going to do that? Who would never fool you? Who would never fool you? Don't don't say like your mom or something. Right. I would never fool you according to, well, even if you don't, whatever your worldview is, everybody would agree if in theory this person would not fool you. God, right? So Descartes says, if I can build my way out of skepticism, because Descartes was a Catholic, right? He was only Catholic. He says, the way I can be, by the way, does anybody know what else Descartes is famous for besides this? Because he's a genius. Does anybody know what else he's famous for? Who knows what this is? He's the father of this. He basically invents this. He and Newton both. What's that? And now you forgot. He's a genius. Like both, all these guys, all these guys are geniuses. Like 
freaking geniuses. Like I couldn't hold a candle to their intellectual prowess. But like what we're talking about, what we talked about earlier, is that it should, we're going to see how even unbelievably intelligent people do what? Can make radical mistakes, right? So anyway, Descartes thinks that if I can get an argument that this exists, that God exists, right, because he's a Roman Catholic, if I can get an argument that shows that God exists, then what? Then what? Then I can get us out of here. How? Because why? Because God would not what? God would not deceive us, right? Now, Descartes gives a version of what's called an ontological argument, meaning, what does ontological mean? Metaphysics, what does that mean? Being itself, right? Now, an empiricist says, no, you have to start with experience, right? Rationalism, remember, what does it say you can start? Right here. So if Descartes says, I can build a perfectly logical argument to the existence of God, right? Don't need experience, right? Because why? All this stuff can fool me, so I can't start with that. If I can build an argument from God's existence straight from here, then I can get us out of this stuff right here. I can get out of skepticism. Now, the bad news for Descartes' argument is that it's a very ingenious and, and very interesting argument. But what is? But remember, what was Descartes' criteria? Well, no, what was his criteria for his philosophy? That is, right? Which was just another way to say what? Doubt it, right? All of his premises have to be premises that can't logically what? Be doubted. Now, we don't have time to get into it, but unfortunately, his premises can be what? Doubted. Now, does that mean they're false? Not necessarily, but can they be doubted? Some of his premises. I know you're not looking at them, so you're like, I don't know, I don't even see them. So you're kind of going to have to take my word for it. You can look up his argument if you want to. But his argument, everyone concedes to this for the most part. His argument, his premises that make up his argument, it's logically possible that the opposite could be true or whatever the case may be. Now, again, his argument's ingenious and it's very interesting. You know, look it up. But the consensus is, and I agree, is that it just doesn't work. It just can't get him what he needs to get based off his own strict super strict criteria foundationalism it just won't work so if he can't get to this this idea of god if he can't prove the existence of god impeccably then what are we still left with skepticism right we're still left here now we've got david hume over here and with others David Hume in Pierce's camp that's going to what? He's going to show you, he's going to take the logical consequence of saying that you can know everything by your senses and do what with that? He's going to get, where is it going to lead us? It's going to lead us right back to skepticism, right? And again, he's almost happy about it, right? He doesn't want this. Descartes doesn't want it. Hume says, I can take us there even over here on this side. And I was almost glad about it in a way. So what's the problem? What are we left with? Let's talk about this for just a second. Roughly, David Hume says his criteria for knowledge is called Hume's Fork. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, we'll probably show you this Monday because we don't have time to get into everything. But essentially, if you can't taste, taste it, touch it, feel it, see it, if it's not some sort of tr uh, logically uh, indisputable truth, such as bachelors or unmarried males, if it's not some sort of relation of ideas like that, that are logically uh, not, not incompatible, or it's not something that's immediately verifiable, then you can't possibly know anything else about it. You can't, but that's the only way to know something is true or not, right? Now, David John Locke, we're gonna to have to back up a little bit. The guy named John Locke, the first empiricist says, how do I know something about this desk? How do I know that that desk is there? 
How do I know something about it? Well, I know about it because as the light you know, comes off, bounces off, and comes into my retinas, and it goes through my optic nerve and all that kind of stuff, I'm, I, I have access to this desk because it's bouncing something off, right? And so I'm seeing, I'm seeing that desk as it, comes to, as it comes through my senses, right? I'm seeing it that way. Or I feel it that way. I touch it. My nerves are stimulated, all those sorts of things, right? Go all the way up my up into my brain, brainstem, hit my brainstem, come back down, all those sorts of things, right? That's how I know it. Now, law calls this thing, in quotes, what does he say? That which I know not what. Yeah, that's something like, it's almost it's that. I think that's what it says. It's quote, unquote, that which I know not what. Why would he say that? And it's about anything outside, anything of reality. That which I know not what. Because he doesn't know the thing, right? Or he thinks he knows the thing, but the way he knows the thing is how? Through what it's giving him, right? His perception of that thing. Now, a guy named Bar David, uh, George Barclay comes along, who's an Anglican priest guy. He will, he's an empiricist, but he's going to take this even further. And he's going to show how that results even in more. All these guys are just freaking geniuses. It's amazing. So anyway, Barclay says... Basically points out that what Locke says, he says, look, Locke, if what you're saying is the way you know this is because you have access to your perceptions, how do you know think something's even there to begin with? Why does that make sense? Because he says if all you have access to are your perceptions of things, what do you have access to? You just have the access, what? To the perceptions. So if all you have is access to your perceptions of things, then why even posit that there's a thing here? You kind of use Occam's razor. Occam's blue pencil cover. He uses Occam's razor and shades off unnecessary what? Speculations. He says, so Barclay says, this is by the way, this is uh, Berkeley, California, named after this guy. So anyway, Barclay says, if you're going to say that the only way you know this is because of the access of your perception of those things, how do you even know this thing is there? Because all you have is your perception of it, right? All you have is your perception of things. That's it. That's all you have. So Barclay even goes further and says, there's not that thing, there's no material thing there. All it is is an idea. Because all you have access to is what? The idea. He said, so, why pop? so his famous example is he says, I'm not saying an apple is not real. He's, I'm just, he says, but the, the, the idea, the perception of an apple just is what? The apple. It just is the real thing, right? So David Hume takes that. He takes all of that stuff. And long story short, you're back into how do you know that you're not just somewhere or what? dreaming if all of you if all you have is access to your perceptions how do you know that your perceptions represent what anything outside of what yourself so right now all of you think that you know an external reality right that there's a reality external to what you there's a reality outside of you that you can know but the, this over here is saying that all you have access to are your perceptions of what? Reality. So you see how logically speaking that goes to what? Well, how do you know that? If all you have access to is your idea, if all you, if all you have access to is your perception of things, then how do you know there's anything what? Outside of what? You. So we would, I would even venture to say that this collapses into a position called what? Solipsism. What is solipsism? Does anybody remember the Henry Rollins band or whatever his name is? He says he's this. A solipsist is what? Somebody thinks that they're the only person that exists in the universe. Right? Not necessarily because they're egotistical, but why? That's all you can know, right? Can't know you can't really know anything else. That you're the only thing that exists, right? Something like that. Now, both of these, we're going to say, intents and purposes, that it 
these result in solipsism and or skepticism that you just can't know anything, right? That's a pretty, that's pretty sad, right? I mean, that's a pretty, pretty pessimistic view, unless you're willing just to say, well, I'm fine with that. I don't care. I'll just live however, whatever. But if you actually want to know the truth about reality, assuming that truth about reality can be known, then what are these going to give you? Are these going to get you there? No. Now, what if you were to say, well, wait a minute, science can rescue us from this. What might you say to that? Science can rescue us from that. Which is based on what? Which is based on what assumption? That you can know it. Right? Science ain't gonna do jack piss to get you out of this. Why? It assumes what? It assumes an first it just assumes an external reality, right? But that's exactly what they're saying. You can't possibly what? No. So you can perform all the scientific what? What? Experiments, hypotheses, carry out the whole scientific method all day long, and you could just be doing that where? Right here, right? You don't know that applies to anything out here at all. But I made an experiment. Fantastic. So did the guy who was asleep over here. Doesn't help you. It's not going to get you anywhere, right? Now, is science a bad thing? No, <laughs> right? But is it the end all be all and it's in, in, in a quest for truth? No, it can't possibly be because it assumes what? Huge philosophical what? Assumptions. Not just some philosophical assumptions, but huge philosophical assumptions. For instance, like what? That your, the scalpel was even flipping there, right? And we're going to get even deeper into that in a second. So in order to combat this, in order to try to get out of this pit, where are we going to have to go? What would Aristotle say? Somebody make a little bracelet. A little, what would Aristotle think? What would, what would Aristotle say here? What's that? Like a what would Jesus do? Yeah, like a what would work with, like WWAT or something. So what so what would he what what might he say here? Or even somebody like his eventual disciple, Aquinas, what that might might he say here? Heck no. Aristotle's not gonna say that. Because remember, who existed in Aristotle's day? This isn't new stuff, right? This isn't new. It was just brought about as new because these guys tried to start something new, right? They tried to start a new endeavor. What does Aristotle want to say? Aristotle, let me get some names right here. Aristotle, what happened? What happened? Aristotle, all these guys are following in this thing. I'll skip one first. Augustine is a city in Florida. Augustine is the philosopher, right? So let's just get that clear. So you know what I'm saying? Where, where, what's the city in Florida? It's named after him, right? But it's not how you say it, right? It's Augustine. So Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, and then all kinds of guys that are Aristotelian in their philosophies, not just necessarily, these are just the best known. Because technically Augustine rejects this. He's more of a what? He's more of a Platonist. He really follows more Plato. Here. But there's going to be principles that are shared between these two lives. Because Plato, because Aristotle was a what? Student of Plato, right? Socrates, 
Plato was a student of Socrates. Plato, student of Socrates. Aristotle, a student of Plato. And then you've got all these other guys, right, after that. But anyway, my question is, what are they going to say to this? They're going to say, you've got to outthink what? These guys, right? You're not going to be able to, do, be able to do that with science or whatever else. You've got to use what? Philosophy. You've got to combat bad philosophy with what would they say? Good philosophy, right? So we're going to have to go way back. Because I'm going to go ahead and tell you, like probably every other philosophy teacher here is going to hold to the modern notion of philosophy. And I don't think, and again, this is maybe in, in interest of full disclosure, I don't think any of their answers are going to work. Because they're going to get you back to either being having to solve it rationalistically or empirically. And I do not think there's a good order. So I think you've got to go back with this guy. You've got to go out where Descartes threw out the baby in the bathwater and all the modern philosophical movement threw out the baby with the bathwater. And you've got to go back and say, wait a minute. Was there something here that can get you out of this? In fact, were these guys even answered then? And we'll see how... They were, hopefully, satisfactorily. See you Monday. If you haven't read that in your book, go ahead and read the rest of that. Because you're going to see how a modern philosopher tries to answer that stuff.